I'm here today with Jeff Wise. He's the president and CEO of Whitewater. How are you doing today, Jeff? Doing well, Chris. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Jeff, uh, uh, I thought we could get started here by, uh, you know, having you uh, maybe introduce yourself and, and kind of how you got to where you were here. Uh, and then you got to tell us about Whitewater because it's an exciting brand, an exciting concept, and I'm sure I cannot do it justice uh, dipping a toe in there. Thanks. Yeah, um, I, that's a lot there. Let me let me try to do it without going too far. Um, yeah, I was born and raised here in Charlotte, grew up in sort of the active outdoor lifestyle because I think you know, most of us at some point uh, get exposed to getting outdoors. And once we get there, we want more of it. And so I've always been active in whether it was biking, whether it was paddling, whether it was backpacking, climbing, you name it. Always loved it. it none of it was really any more compelling to me than the other. And that was kind of the, the cool thing about it was as long as you could get outside and go do something that kind of got you exhilarated, that was fun. I think what I did not understand, it was sort of like all the other stick and ball sports I was involved in. You were growing through the challenge associated with that engagement. Um, all I knew was it was fun. It was exciting. It was neat. Um, but now in hindsight, I realized, wow, you're growing through it. You're challenging yourself. You're pushing yourself. And you really are, it, you, you, by being engaged, you realize that that's the way life uh, should be. And so what we've tried to do with Whitewater is, is really build opportunities for people to engage in that active outdoor lifestyle. We try to keep it broad. We have lots of music out here. We have lots of competitions. We have anything where you can be just engaged by sitting in your chair, by watching films um, from a paddling trip in Banff, Canada, for example. Um, but either way, we just want to get you excited and motivate you, whether it's thinking about it on the drive to work, whether it's the drive to the mountains, whether it's actually while you're uh, engaged with us here at the Whitewater Center in Charlotte, whether it's one of our outposts out in Pisgah or down in Santee or up in Virginia. It's just we want to create compelling reasons for you to get outside and play. Well, that is awesome. So. You, you have multiple locations here, right? Uh, you know, so so how big is, let, let's talk uh, uh, your Charlotte set. How big is your facility in Charlotte? Well, uh, that, that facility is called the U.S. National Whitewater Center. Uh, it was our sort of our home base for a number of years. We started with about 270 acres on the Catawba River, right outside the city of Charlotte. Uh, we are now about 1,300 acres, still right on the river. Uh, we have a, uh, the world's largest artificial whitewater course that we built here. Uh, we've got class three, four white water in the channels. We've got uh, climbing walls. We've got a, a deep water solo course uh, or walls, which is basically climbing over a really, really deep pool so that you're not belayed. You, when you fall, you just land in the water. Uh, we've got zip lines. We've got ropes courses. We've got 50 miles of trails. So mountain biking's huge out here, just trail running. Uh, we do Gosh, I think we do 73 different competitions in a year. So just about any week, we've got something going on from either a, a ultra marathon to a uh, bouldering competition to uh, we have uh, the last four. Let's see. We've had the last four Olympic trials here for canoe kayak slalom. Uh, so it's a it's a wide range. We've got a new event we're doing called uh, Peak to Pines, where it's a bike race, um, actually a, a relay race from Pisgah, uh, which is Brevard, North Carolina, essentially down to Charleston. Um, it's in any, any form of two wheeled vehicle, as long as it's uh, not electric, meaning as long as it's not <laughs> motorized in any way. Um, and you get from point A to point B and you can do it with teams of anywhere from one to six. So that's, uh, that's the Whitewater Center. Uh, we've also now have outposts in, as I mentioned in Pisgah, which is right in the North Mills recreation area. What we've done there is real typical. We, we will buy some property that we think either needs to be conserved or protected, and we will try to uh, basically glom on or connect to other areas of significance. So in that case, we're now uh, surrounded by Pisgah National Forest, which is 550 acres that is um, run, managed by the uh, National Forest Service, which is part of the uh, Department of Agriculture, one of the federal agencies. And then we also have uh, down at uh, Santee, which is down near Charleston, South Carolina, we have 323 acres there that are part of, uh, really surrounded on all sides, either by the uh, Francis Marion National Forest or the Bono Ferry uh, Wildlife Reserve. So what we try to do is find areas that could be developed or that could be threatened, and we try to protect them by acquisition. 
and but we also try to do it in areas where there's already other compelling natural assets. Um, and then we just try to highlight areas that are fun. If you in down at Santee, for example, world class uh, fly fishing, world class saltwater, freshwater, uh, world class mountain biking, gravel riding, uh, flat water paddling, you name it, it's all down there. It's just some of the best areas to go play. But you're also 20 minutes from some of the best eating and dining that you can have in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. So it's just, we, we try to find ways to get people where they're already around and get them more active. Love it. Absolutely love it. So I'm, I'm listening to all of this, right? And, and, and the first thing I'm thinking about is, uh, you know, this has to be unique to staff. Uh, you, you know, you, you, from a talent perspective, uh, you know, you con- you have to constantly be looking for talent. Is that is that accurate, or is that uh, you know, or you guys have a pretty decent pipeline? Yeah, I think um, uh, there's not an organization alive that would tell you talent is probably one of the most, if not the most important thing. Um, and and I'm trying to think of something that I would tell you is more important um, <laughs> than than talent. I'm not sure I know what it is. Um, you know, but I will tell you. The challenge to that is we have about a thousand employees now. Um, the problem is making sure that everybody understands they themselves as individuals are not that important. Um, I can tell you, if I die today, this organization rocks along just fine without me. <laughs> and they remind me of that every day and I'm keenly aware of it. Um, that's the difference, Chris. What I find fascinating is, you know, the world says all the time, you know, you're nothing without your talent. You couldn't be more correct with that statement. But what individuals think is that means them, and it's the opposite. It is the aggregate. It is the talent that you have. Think if we're a baseball team, um, I'm a Braves fan. The Braves lost Freddie Freeman. Uh, that's a blow. But you know they 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 replace Freddie, and others pick up, and that's just the way teams work. Um, it doesn't mean Freddie wasn't great. It doesn't mean Freddie is uh, not one of your favorite people. But we we can all come and go. But without the talent, the Braves are, are nothing. But it's not the individuals. It is the talent and the, and the greater, and, and that greater concept. That makes a ton of sense. I mean, it, you know, I think the individualization of everybody's efforts has become uh, huge on the forefront of, of how everybody thinks about work now. But, uh, you know, that aggregated effort, uh, it, it's really easy to apply to sports analogies. But then when you think about your team, uh, it, it, we are, of course, the sum of our parts. But it, it's that sum that we're all trying to get to, right? It's the sum that everybody enjoys uh, and sees and sees that fulfillment. And at least I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the terms that we used to hear as kids was, you know, maturity and then it became sort of emotional maturity and then it became, you know, self-actualization. When you know, use your terms, you know, it, with Maslow's theory or what have you, but it's really true. And I mean, it's one of the, you know, one of the few good things about getting old, is you, you unless you're a complete lame brain, you you do start to develop some emotional maturity, and the key to emotional maturity is is that self awareness. And awareness of self makes you start to realize it ain't about me. Um, you know, the best thing about becoming a parent, uh, as as you know very well, is oh, it's being a part of something much bigger than yourself. And I think that what's happening is we keep the media and I'm using that term in, in, in the broad sense. It is not about you know, the, the literal sense, right. but everything <laughs> right. out there is trying to hammer individual value. And you know, guys, with all due respect, none of us are that valuable. There's what, how many billions of people on the earth right now? And we've been around for some three, three billion years. Uh, we, we're going to come and go. We ain't that important individually, but what is important is the effort, and the, the, the purpose that you have every day to create value. Um, but you yourself are not that important in the bigger picture, but you must know that what you do matters because when you do it well, the team will do better. And that's where the satisfaction comes. And that's being satisfied every day, I think is what we're all looking for. And that satisfaction, in my opinion, comes from knowing that what you did was absolutely the best you could do. And if it wasn't, that's okay. You're going to go back and give it a, you know, a, a better shot tomorrow and keep improving and keep growing. And that growth through trying to create value, I think is the essence of life. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more. And, and so, you know, when I listen to the, the concept of value and growth in the aggregate, 
you know, how are how are you looking at or how are you dealing with, you know, this this other concept that's out there, right, which is uh, the the work life balance concept, right, you know, where uh, it's it's everybody using the individualization, uh, you know, kind of of their career which kind of pulls from the opposite of that, that, that thinking, you know, the aggregate thinking, you know, I, I, how are you viewing the work-life balance conversation right now? It, it probably comes up in every single interview we do. And I, I used to kind of gloss over it because I didn't feel like it was really appropriate to try to sit down with a 23 year old or 26 year old person and get into this high minded concept of, that you're asking. But I think it is an absolute problem that exists this mindset of work-life balance. And, and so I, I, I reach out and throttle it now. And I say, guys, you know, balance means you have a fulcrum. And if there's a fulcrum in order to balance it, you have to have two, two measures or two weights on the on opposite ends. And so they are competing with each other. And if you have work and life competing against each other, then something's wrong. Uh, that, that's, that's an inherently misguided concept. Work is a part of life. And I think the concept that you're saying is we're, life is a continuum. Where your family is, where your um, uh, work is, where your you know, solace and standing next to a, you know, a, a beautiful mountain, where all that is, it's just part of a continuum. But they're not balanced against each other. They're not buckets. They're not things that compete. They are things that work together. And if you can make them work together, well, that's when life is working. And that and if you want to say that's the balance, yeah, maybe that works. But it is not work life. Life is a continuum and work is a part of that. And, you, it, and if you can't get comfortable with that, then I think you're toast. Because unless you are that you know, trust fund kid that doesn't have to work, um, you know, then, then all of us are going to be working. And the more you can make work a meaningful and valuable part of your life, now you're cooking with gas. And that's what I think all of us heard as kids. And I think somehow that's getting lost in this individual mindset that you're describing. So I, I, I love, I love the, the, the tie in there with meaningful and valuable, right? So when you're explaining, uh, you know, work and life and, and, the, and the continuum that that all works on, when you're talking to people that are coming through applicants or even your own team, uh, you know, I think that 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 concept of of value maybe translates, you know, as you put it in the media to, to you know, the why or the purpose, right? Finding purpose or finding why. So so how are you discussing, you know, the value uh, of what work brings to the table in these conversations? Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I'll say I'll say this a little bit negatively. Yeah. When you've got a one hour conversation in an interview, for example, they're in there thinking, I got to ace this interview. I've got an objective. I'm here to, to get a job. And listening to some old fart telling them, you know, a broader perspective is not really, it's, it's not going to be that effective. Um, and, and you really are kind of working against a lot of the popular culture that's, that's saying other things because they're not really stopping and thinking, wait a minute, what does that really mean? And, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we try hard to see the folks that have that emotional maturity early on. Um, and I always struggle with that. I mean, very few of us are, have any maturity of any type at 23 or 33 <laughs> for that matter. But it is learning that it is about not about you. And that's one of the reasons, I'll be honest, we, we've really fallen in love over the years with people that have some life experience. Um, if you've played... Uh, you know, uh, a sport where the coach and the team really gave you a sense of who you were and where you were. Uh, my daughter plays lacrosse and our coach uh, has a mantra. Uh, she's at um, uh, Washington Elite. And her coach says, I am third. And that means the player is third, the team is second, and, and Washington Elite lac women's lacrosse is number one. And I love that concept. Yeah, you know, you're not going to be here in four years but this organization is going to be here hopefully for the long haul. And how do you make that organization better? That's the meaning that we're talking about. Not how many hours, of, or sorry, how many minutes of playtime you got. No, that coach doesn't want to hear that. And that doesn't matter. What matters is what could you do that created value for the goals and objectives of that team? 
And if that means you know carrying somebody's water, if that means scoring the winning goal, if that means making the, 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 the inbound pass, whatever it is, you need to realize that you played a valuable, meaningful role in that effort. Uh, Chris, one other thing that I'll tell you that, 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 that I've tried to preach to my kids, and I use my poor kids are always the ones that have to hear me <laughs> say the things that I kind of realize as I do all this. We interview people all the time. And one of the things that I get, Chris, that, that I hope people can, can, can switch uh, and go the other direction. I'll ask somebody at the end, I'll say, so why should we hire you? Chris, 95% of the time, they tell us that they should, we should hire them because why? It would be good for them. So think about it this way, Chris. Yeah, they go, oh, because I love this or because I'm looking for this or because this would be good for me. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm gonna, you want me to pay you $75,000 a year because it's good for you? <laughs> That's not why we're in this interview. You, you tell me how you're going to create value for this organization. That's your answer. But they don't think of it that way. And they're not bad people. It's not, they, I'm not, you know, my, and I tell my kids that. I go, don't go in there telling somebody why you should be on the team because it's good for you. You know, that's an idiotic <laughs> statement. You should go in there and tell that coach because I'm going to make this team be more successful. And then you can give them specifics. You know, I got a great arm or I got great speed. You know, I think my speed will contribute to the team in the following way. That, that, but, but because I like lacrosse, well, nah, you know, so does everybody. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not hiring, I'm not putting you on this team because you like one, you know, because it'll help you meet more, you know, girls or boys. <laughs> That's great. So, so when we look, when we think about purpose and we think about value, uh, you know, and, and we're talking about, you know, this, this whole concept of everybody wanting to find purpose in what it is they do for work. Right. Let, let's, let's play that out a bit. Right. Cause I think that's an important conversation to have, you know, when people talk about purpose or the, or, or the why, I, I feel like a lot of people jump to that uh, saving the world mentality, right. You know, is this feeding the homeless? Is this defeating climate change or, or whatever, whatever it is they have in their head. Do you see it the same way when you're finding purpose or, or, or is there another, is there another way to look at that? Yeah, I, you're hitting it. And I see it all the time. One of my, the, the best examples of that, Chris, people will say to me, I want to work for a not-for-profit. And I, I immediately crack up at that. I'm like, a not-for-profit is simply a tax filing status, folks. Um, you know, up until recently, the NFL was a not-for-profit. Right, Blue right. Cross Blue Shield is a not-for-profit. Um, you know, those are tax filing statuses, guys. Yeah, now they have to have it in the Elio Mazenary purpose. I'm not disagreeing with that. What they're really trying to say is that they want to do something that has meaning. They want to do something that has value. And, and, I, don't, and I don't have any, you know, you, you can't disagree with that. That's absolutely fine. I mean, if, if, if you know, saving the planet is is your driving uh, force, I get it. But here's the reality. 99% of us are not saving the planet through what we do to earn a paycheck. Um, what I do, um, you know, do I think in some way that it has a positive impact on society? Yeah, I, I absolutely believe that. But that ultimately is not what drives me. Um, it feels good and I'm very aware of it and it makes me um, proud. It makes me feel, feel good. But I'll tell you what drives me. What drives me is when I do my job well, then I help others be successful at what they're trying to do. And together we're able to achieve common goals and objectives. And that's the purpose that I think all of us are really trying to find that, yeah, I, I would, I would not, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, God, this is, I hadn't thought about it this way. I, I used to practice law, I was a litigator and thought that would be a pretty decent job, thought it'd be fun and it is fun but it doesn't have a great deal of purpose. Cause one of the things that bummed me out was after my first several trials, I realized that no matter what I did, it didn't really affect anything. Um, I, I, I said, it's sort of like kissing your sister, you know, it, 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 yeah, it may have felt good, but what's the purpose? I mean, at the end of the day, what's really going on there. And, and, and I didn't feel like if I did a great job that it really impacted much. Um, it was, you know, I used to say it was sort of like um, playing tennis and the line judge ruled the ball was out arbitrarily um, because at the end of the day, 
litigation is, is a really tough way to solve disputes, resolve disputes, that kind of stuff. So you know, it's a round, really very roundabout way of answering your question that meaning, in my opinion, is really a better, better stated as purpose. And purpose means that what you do matters, not because it's saving the world, but because it has an impact. And that impact may simply be that if you're a bus driver, that you got people to where they needed to be on time and they can rely on you to get them to where they need to be. And so, you know, if you're a, um, I think we really are doing a horrible job now in the media. We're trying to tell people nobody should have to do these jobs that they're beneath us. Well, that, nothing could be further from the truth. No job is beneath anybody. Um, we, you know, Chris, I know it, it, where you are in your, your organization, you've had to do some pretty rough things and some pretty, you know, um, uh, what, what, what would not be sexy or glamorous, um, <laughs> but it mattered because it made it made us all get to where we needed to get to. Um, so I think that's what we're talking about is meaning and purpose are really results driven in the sense of we, we are helping us achieve our goals and objectives. I love that. So, you know, as we are, you know, as we're trying to build organizations, right? I think the, you know, the, the idea is, is that, you know, work shouldn't be competitive with quote unquote life, right? It's, 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 it's all one, it's all one bucket. It's not a bunch of separate buckets. It's all one bucket. Right. And what you're trying to do here is, is, you know, fill that bucket with stuff that means something to you, right. Or, or that you can find value in, whether that's at home, whether that's uh, uh, climbing a wall, whether that's, uh, you know, at work, uh, it, it has to have value to, to really one person. Right. And that's, that's you. Uh, and I think that's kind of an interesting concept that, you know, if we're trying to individualize anything, I guess that's the thing to individualize. Right. Yeah. I, I, let me read it back to you and see if, see if, if, if you're comfortable with this, we talked about it a little earlier. Yeah. One of the things I think is, is a challenge for people right now is everybody's trying to figure out their purpose. You know, why do I exist and all that? And, you know, I don't want to get into the greater metaphysical of that, but I think it does come down to something pretty simple. If the earth has been around for 3 billion years and we're on it for, you know, if we have a good life, let's say 90 to 100, well, let's give ourselves some context. You know, we're not really that important to the bigger picture, but when you're here, create the most value you can. Uh, this is going to sound very um, Calvinistic maybe or Presbyterian or Scottish, but my concept in my head is if you're not doing something of value, then, you know, what, what do you, why are you here now value back to the, what we said, Chris, it just means pick up the water, pick up that pail, you know, pick up that rock, but go to work and create value. And I think when people, you know, everybody's talking about the mental health challenges right now. And I think it's pretty simple. I, I, I really, stay very, very happy and very, very satisfied because I keep it simple. I figure out how to do something that will matter that day. Once again, not because I'm saving a life or you know, change, you know, addressing world peace, but that if I do something to move the ball forward and be productive, then I'm just finding enormous satisfaction in that. It can be cutting the grass. Uh, you just got to be productive. You got to create value. And I think we have we're in a society now where we have shelter, we have food. Um, government's trying to figure out how to put enough money in our pockets to make sure that we're, we're always okay. Yeah, you know, 30, 50, 100 years ago, you know, you had, if you weren't producing, you were probably dying. Um, <laughs> now you don't have to produce to survive, but I think we need to survive in the in in the greater sense and to and to survive it means we have to produce we have to be out slaying the woolly mammoth um you know uh keeping the 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 cave warm keeping the cave clean whatever it is it has not changed um it's not for survival in the sense of of, of physically dying but i think we're mentally dying if we're not out there being productive yeah i could agree with you more i i think that you know, whoever's listening to this, uh, you know, if they are uh, uh, struggling with either answering this question, right, you know, with 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 identifying what what you do with the work life balance issue or 
uh, if you're on the other side of this and you're trying to find that purpose, I think I think we've hit on a lot of those topics here, and hopefully, uh, it's gonna it's gonna lead to a different conversation or a different set of conversations where. Uh, you know, people are at least able to start talking to the same language and, and, and people are able to start finding things that matter to them, uh, which is really, I, I think, kind of the important part of doing this, right? Creating that value, moving the ball forward. Uh, you know, you feel better at every stage of your life at that point. Chris, it's funny. I mean, I don't want to make this sound like that I'm, I'm tying it back to, to Whitewater. I think it's just one, it's, it's one fact pattern that, that we're familiar with. You know, I watch this all the time. People love the, the human condition is is really driven to get outside. We want to be outside, whether it's the vitamin D and the sunshine, whether it's the you know the oxygen, whatever it is. But our souls are rejuvenated by being outside, and yet we also need the comfort of shelter. You know, back to the cave we were just talking about. You know, I watch it all the time. I'm I'm going to Alaska actually on Sunday, and going out for 15 days and you know um, doing some you know mostly some some climbing and backpacking out in the outback. I'll tell you what, I'm making sure that at the end of those 15 days that I got comfort when I get back. Our bodies, our minds need to be pushed. We need to get out of our comfort zone because that's how we grow. We only grow through challenge. Now we go to the gym in order to break those muscles down, challenge them, but we also have to give them the time to, to repair. And that is, we got to go sit on the couch. So we've, we, I think society has gotten confused because when we, we created the very compelling need to get on the couch, but we've forgotten that we have to get off the couch too. And it is that, you know, it, it is that yin yang that goes on there. And I, I'm the first to be aware of it. I love being on the couch, baby. It feels good, <laughs> but you got to earn the damn couch. And if you don't, then things are going to start to get out of whack. And, and you know, look at anybody who is struggling with some of the depression issues and other physical issues such as diabetes and obesity and so forth. If they can break the cycle to get back off the couch, um, it, it works. But there is a vicious, vicious competitive thing there between you know, the, 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 the challenge and the relaxation. But you got to remember, you got to get back on that bench and start pressing. You got to get back on that, uh, you know, that stairmaster and do it. It sucks, but when you do it, <laughs> you know how much you love it. And Absolutely. when you're out of balance, yeah. But if but you you've probably done it, Chris. I know you run and so forth. If you don't go relax, you're going to break it down and you're going to get into a whole other set of hurt. So it is about the two working together. But growth comes from challenge. Absolutely. Well, I couldn't put that better myself. And so I'm not going to try. So, uh, you know, one of the things I do like to do here, though, with the show is as we wrap up, I like to ask uh, for a piece of advice. And I feel like we've given a ton already today. But uh, if you do you have any advice that you like to give to your new leaders as they're coming in, uh, uh, working for you, something that we can translate out uh, to the greater audience? Yeah. And you know, why is it that old guys feel like they're the ones that have advice? And I think it's because we got it all when we were kids. It didn't have any make sense or have any context because we were too stupid. Um, I think when you get older, you start seeing a few things that, that with a perspective by looking in, in the rear view mirror. And I think there's two things I would tell you. One is real simple um, that I did not see as a kid. We, we spend so much time at, in our early stages building relationships. That's what we do. And human beings, you know, it, 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 as young kids, it's all about relationships. We get the satisfaction from it. And, and the volume of relationships is really a big part of it. The depth of the relationships are probably not as important as the volume to us when we're 15, 18, what have you. And I think what happens is we get into the workplace and we're starting to transition. There's the, 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 the depth of the relationships are starting to really improve and become more important. But what I always try to tell everybody is, look, accountability, when you, when you step into the workplace, it's all about getting it done. It's all about accountability. And it's a real challenge to transition from relationship to leader. And, and, and I'm trying to remind folks, hey, being a leader sometimes means that you're not about being popular. You're not about being everybody's friend. Um, that's that I can tell you, the, what's the old line? I don't know the secret to success, but one thing it's certainly not is, uh, is trying to make everybody happy all the time. <laughs> you know, that's, that's an illusory process. So. My, my first advice to everybody is do the right thing. It's going to be tough and 
it, it absolutely make, I've gotten lightheaded going into meetings where I've had to fire somebody where I knew that it was the right thing to do for the team, but I hated it on a personal basis. But after it was all said and done, everybody was better for it. Uh, yep. So, so that's, a, that's, that'll come. And when the more you, you realize that accountability leads to results and that's where, the, that's where, that's where the, 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 the rare air and the success is and the value is. The other thing I would tell you is, is a part of that is realizing that as you go through this continuum we're talking about, you go from doing to leading and managing more. Uh, I always say you lead, th you lead people, you manage things. When, you're, when, when you first start out, you're probably your value is what you can do. But by the time you start to grow and really become more productive, if you're only creating value from what you do, it's hard to scale that. Uh, you've only got so many hours in the day. You scale through leadership. The more you can leverage others, the more you can leverage uh, you know, resources, both um, people and, and, and things, that's when you can start to lead and manage. And so really be aware that you start to flip somewhere in your career. And once again, it's not a, you know, it's not a defining point generally, but it is a continuum as you keep describing. And you, you be aware that in order to move in that continuum, you've got to become more of a leader and a manager and not a doer. Um, when I'm doing, I'm probably not at my highest and best use. Um, yep. That's, and, and I think that's, that's something that I'm, I'm more aware of now is that, that leadership and management skills are in a rare, that's a rare thing to find. And I would strongly urge that everybody start to realize where are you in that? If you're a doer, I can be fine. Uh, you know, if you're an, let's say an engineer, if you're a civil engineer and the best thing you can do is be working those plans and, and de designing and all that, man, do it and build those hours. But the more you can be a partner where you can get others to do what it is they do, that's where you can leverage. Not everybody should be a leader. Um, a lot of us suck at it. And you're probably looking <laughs> at one of the best, best examples. But it is it, you leverage through that leadership and be aware of whether you're a leader or not and, and be OK with it. If you're not and, and you're not good at it and, and it's not really what you want to do, that's OK. Uh, just be a damn good doer then. Absolutely. Well, I couldn't put it better myself, Jeff. That's awesome. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, you know, Jeff, if uh, people want to find out more about Whitewater, uh, where are they going? Whitewater.org. Perfect. Beautiful. And uh, do you by any chance frequent any uh, uh, platforms where anybody can follow you, like LinkedIn or something like that? I, um, I am on zero social media. Good for you. Um, I'm 59 in a couple of days, so that, you know, somewhere in there, that probably is a part of it. But I am, I, I, I am, I stay out of, out of that world. So best way to do it is just call me or email me. I guess that may be some form of digital uh, connectivity, but I'm, uh, I'm not anywhere that you will find me. That is awesome. That is awesome. Well, they can find you at Whitewater. So uh, yes. that's, uh, that's the best place to do it. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, I look forward to connecting with you again in the future. Would love to. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jeff.